Good morning. Uh, in this uh, first presidential address, I'll briefly describe one aspect of the research happening in our group. And it's, uh, it so happens that uh, this uh, topic which uh, I gave about in August becomes accidentally more relevant because the Nobel Prize on graphene was announced in, in uh, October. So this is just a coincidence and it was not meant to be uh, uh, planned. Okay, so this uh, I will briefly discuss the excitement uh, of uh, research in nanotubes first which led uh, in a very natural fashion to the search for the two dimensional form of carbon namely graphene. So this talk uh, uh, will uh, have a overview of this where our work will fit in in the last uh, 30 minutes. So this talk is all about carbon. So we will be looking at uh, the element, namely carbon, sorry, is this one? Namely carbon, which is the, one of the elements known from ancient times. And we know in Latin language, carbo means coal. So today's talk is all about carbon. And the form which we all know are the two allotropic forms, namely diamond and graphite, which have been known for ages. And they have very different properties because the bonding between carbon atoms is very different. So we go from sp3 to sp2 which changes the properties of these two allotropic forms. This was the scene till 1980s when almost a heavenly intervention came in for us. And that was the missing, that was the puzzle of some lines from interstellar dust which were not able to identify from the known elements. So there was a big rush to understand these spectral lines and there was a theoretical uh, attempt which suggested that some of these lines could come from linear carbon chains. So these uh, experiments were being done by laser ablation of graphite to make linear carbon chains and see if they could explain what uh, astronomers were observing. Along that came the surprise when they were making this linear carbon chains. In the mass spectrum, they found some uh, very specific peak corresponding to 720 atomic mass units, which is C60. And that set the ball rolling for this new forms of carbon. So then in 1990 was the year when it was known how to make this fullerenes in your kitchen just by arc discharge, very very cheap and efficient method. And 1996 was the Nobel Prize in Chemistry to the three inventors, Carl, Smalley and Proto. And this is the Buckminster fullerene molecule named after this architect uh, who had predicted that these are very stable structures. And then we have other things C70, C84 and so on. So from three dimensional carbon, zero dimensional carbon came on the scene. This molecule size is 7 angstrom. So it has uh, pentagons and hexagons, 20 hexagons, 12 pentagons, very uh, well uh, known Eulerian solid. And then came in 91 the discovery of multi-wall carbon nanotubes when they were making fullerenes. These are concentric sheets of graphite rolled. The interspacing is 3.4 angstrom. Length can be many microns. And 93 saw the discovery uh, or identification of single wall carbon nanotube. So 1985, fullerenes. 1990, a big way to produce fullerenes. 91, uh, arc discharge method to make uh, multi-wall. 93 single wall and uh, many people are associated in particular Professor Ijima's group which played a role in uh, making this uh, discovery. So the best way to understand a nanotube is to take a graphene sheet and roll it around a given axis. 
Now the way you roll this is a way to understand it and you can define this nanotube in terms of the diameter of the nanotube and how you fold it which means how hexagons are oriented with respect to the nanotube axis that defines all the properties so in uh, technical terms the n and m these two integers which define a chiral vector which you fold define all the properties of this nanotube and interestingly when n and m are equal these are called armchair because that is how the bonds look like this is zigzag how the bonds look like and chiral means they have no mirror symmetry about the axis they define all the properties so here we have a very interesting thing that for the same material without any doping you can have metallic nanotubes and you can have semiconducting nanotubes and you can easily understand from solid state physics which i will not do that if these two integers are n minus n is three times integer it is a metallic tube so you can have situations same diameter tube but slightly differently rolled when you make it by different process gives you a semiconducting tube or a metallic tube and when you make them in the lab two third are semiconducting one third are metallic and nothing could be more satisfying to see the founder of this president uh, of this academy uh, professor raman what he discovered which we know as raman effect in 1928 and got the nobel prize in 1930 it couldn't have been more relevant as it is now for the nano science so in nano materials which are of the order of a few nanometer you need new eyes and new fingers to deal with those situations you need to characterize them you need to understand them and it uh, has really now come as a boom that raman spectroscopy which professor raman discovered has become an indispensable tool to deal with the nano materials i'll give you one example so this is so satisfying when i present this talk in this academy to go back to professor raman so for example in nano tube you can have at any given temperature we know atoms vibrate so there is a vibration all the breathing mode so this nano tube diameter changes symmetrically and this diameter frequency is characteristic of the diameter of the nano tube this is so fortunate so when you make this nano tube of course you need to characterize by transmission electron microscopy atomic force microscopy and so on but raman is the most uh, convenient and easy method because if you record raman spectrum this frequency around 100 and about 180 wave number or so or the radial breathing mode is inversely proportional to the diameter it is so nice immediately you can know if you have nano tubes in your sample or if it is graphite or if it is multi wall and this diameter if there are many diameters present in the sample you will immediately know and this is the frequency which is close to what happens in graphite graphite has a vibration at 1582 it is related to carbon vibration this vibration because of quantum size effects makes splits into six vibrations so this is so specific to a metallic tube vis a vis semiconducting tube that you can completely identify the diameter from here and the metallic or the semiconducting nature from this tangential breathing a tangential mode so raman spectroscopy has come out as the most powerful method uh, in this nano carbon research now these nano tubes have exceptional property many many of them this is a very small catalog they have high tensile strength they do not break even if you bend like you take a bamboo of of a nano tube you bend it to 160 degrees you release it they recover a completely uh, remarkable resilience thermal stability is large high thermal conductivity uh, field emission at low bias because they have high aspect ratio and high current density they can support and it is the that is the reason that the interconnects in the semiconducting industry are uh, being thought of are already uh, at a very advanced stage to be made from carbon nanotubes and this is a thing which i put at the last minute 
that even in nano agriculture which uh, this is the report which appeared in current science uh, uh, our journal which was a news report on a paper in acs nano which uh, shows some of these nanotubes uh, it is a big game uh, that they can go very easily in cells and they have a very high uh, propensity to do endocytosis and uh, uh, related things so with that uh, in mind they have shown these people that they can enhance seed germination and plant growth as one of the application but this is just just to uh, curiosity not that it will be done and your tomatoes may not have this nanotubes whether it is safe or not billions of issues are there but just to tell you in very unconnected fields also there are attempts this is again a, a slide i made out of a news report from times of india some time back where it says japanese scientists plan elevator ride to space and why did i put it in my talk the reason is if you read it actually this is space elevator is not a new concept you know it's a fiction and that fiction started uh, right from 1895 and and it became popular after arthur clark the mountain of paradise he talks about the space elevator going from somewhere in sri lanka in the space and you may these are the artistic drawings from nasa website and the idea is that you can make the space elevator you can uh, 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 do this but this requires the key component of this requires a ultra strong rope which should be very very strong but should not be heavy otherwise by its own weight it will die so the only material which is possible which has been shown to be possible is carbon nanotube composite the only material so far because of that the science fiction idea is being taken seriously and if you read this uh, japanese report they have actually lots of companies and lots of uh, prizes for young students if you are here uh, to see what from their website what all they are trying to see if it is feasible so this is one thing where the discovery in science make some uh, uh, fas uh, fascinations uh, come true if at all after many many years it also has lot of commercial sense because there are lots of application composites nanotube composites are extremely strong and this market in 2007 was 64 million dollars already and 2011 is 450 million dollars enormous market which has grown over the last 10 years so the total market is about a billion dollar so this you can see that how a small a, a discovery made in 1991 within uh, this 20 years already it is into uh, this commercial scene so i started with this uh, diamond and graphite three dimensional carbon i brought you to zero dimensional carbon namely fullerene then i said 91 was the discovery of nanotubes so this is one dimensional carbon so what was missing from this happy family was two dimensional carbon and what is two dimensional carbon we all know it is just a sheet of carbon made uh, in way you can isolate a graphene graphite so here this is the two dimensional carbon and this was made possible by the discovery from the uh, manchester group by an extraordinary simple technique so the technique which you can all do within 10 minutes is you take the right scotch tape take the right graphite crystal or highly oriented pyrolytic graphite at hopg or if you have nice friends in ngi uh, ngri you can get a single crystal naturally occurring you take those crystals and put the cello tape on that peel it off you would have all seen any layered material will peel off after that with the right uh, force and the right uh, way you can put it on a substrate and remove it if you do it correctly few times you can isolate single layer of carbon two layers of carbon three layers of carbon and so on and this is precisely what was done in this paper and this is precisely the Uh, what happened in the last 10, six years that 
these two gentlemen got the Nobel Prize. So this science paper is from Manchester group with the scotch tape and this resulted in this year's Nobel Prize which reads for groundbreaking experiments regarding the two-dimensional material graphene. So Andre Guy is about 51 years old and uh, Novislo who was a student and then a postdoc now is a professor in Manchester is 36 years old. So just uh, when he made he was a young associate like 33. So this is where the discovery got awarded this recognition so on. <laughs> Since then there have been many methods to make this graphene. So you can make uh, uh, by chemical vapor deposition, you can break methane over copper or nickel then you can transfer it on a given substrate. You can make by chemical method, you can exfoliate graphite, you can oxidize <coughs> them and then you can make single sheets. You can make them in huge quantities uh, which uh, are suspended in water or any other solvent. You can make by heating silicon carbide and again you will get a single or double layer graphene. Now over the last many uh, six years, all these methods have grown for the right application. But the best graphene is still made by this uh, scotch tape technology because the defects are very few and you can make very high quality devices. So what are the implications of this honeycomb lattice on the physical properties? And why is there so much excitement? So in a very uh, simple manner, one is easy to understand from our high school that graphene is a honeycomb lattice with two atoms per unit cell, A and B. Both are carbon, but these are two interpenetrating lattices. So you have this bonding sp2 form, what is remaining is this pz orbital. So if you look at the band structure, energy versus momentum, it has a different momentum space. At a specific point in momentum space, which is called k point in the jargon of condensed matter physics, the energy is linear in momentum, which is a big thing because for free electrons or electrons in semiconductor, it is double. E is equal to p square over 2m. It is quadratic. This is exactly like photons. So electrons behave like photons, massless Dirac particles in graphene. And this is the excitement which gives rise to very beautiful physics. So now you have two sub lattices A and B. So any electronic state you have to tell how much is coming from A sub lattice, how much is coming from B sub lattice. This is like a pseudo spin. So the Hamiltonian for people who have to write the energy diagram exactly looks not like a Schrodinger equation but a Dirac equation. And this is the massless uh, zero mass particle where the spin is replaced by the pseudo spin. Pseudo spin means the identification whether it is from A sub lattice or B sub lattice. So on this Dirac equation has many uh, these things. This was predicted way back in 1948 that these are linear dispersion and which will have many features of this relativistic quantum mechanics. So you have a large low energy manifestation of 2 plus 1 dimensional quantum electrodynamics, very large mobility at room temperature because they, these electrons do not get easily scattered, they are uh, ballistic even at room temperature uh, and they have a ballistic length of 2 micron. What it means? They move like bullets, not like the drunkard uh, Brownian motion and which makes very high speed devices. And beautiful thing is, now you have a two dimensional electron gas because you have only one sheet of carbon. Because if you have 2D electron gas, you can get what is called quantum Hall effect, for which the Nobel Prize was given long back for gallium arsenide devices. So the beauty is, you have this two dimensional electron gas, apply a magnetic field. This magnetic field quantizes the motion of this electron. These are called Landau levels. Because of that, you get this behavior that the, uh, quantum, the Hall effect gets quantized and it is given in terms of something which I will not write, uh, read it. This is a beautiful signature of 2D electron gas and the way that it is anomalous, it is not the same as 2D electron gas for other material, it proved that these were massless Dirac particles. 
and these were done in the 2004 paper of uh, Noveslov and Guy, which for which uh, the Nobel Prize is given. Now, very recently, it is shown that these electrons are not not mean free light; they interact with each other. Because of that, you have another exotic state of matter called fractional quantum Hall effect, for which another Nobel Prize was given a few years back, and that has also been uh, seen few months, a uh, few. Uh, uh, last year uh, in this graphene and now this effect has been seen at room temperature all the quantum hall effect experiments are done below 4 kelvin helium temperature in this material because of the technical rings the spacings are large between levels you can see this effect at room temperature so beautiful quantum phenomena you are seeing at room temperature as I said, they play billiards. If you, if you read this paper, you shoot an electron in graphene, it behaves exactly like a billiard ball. So you can play quantum billiard with graphene. And also now, graphene is the strongest material and the most flexible. So you can punch a needle, which is a, of course, atomic force microscope needle, into graphene, it deforms, you retract, it comes back. And this is the uh, why it is called now the strongest material uh, uh, available and the most flexible one which is not the case with diamond diamond breaks here the graphene sheet does not break it recovers once the force is so there are enormous applications of graphene which are being talked about uh, can it replace silicon because you can make fast devices answer is not that but question is, this is a good candidate for many fast device applications. There are problems which are uh, which have to be sorted out, but the question now uh, is worth asking. You can make ultra high frequency analog transistors because they have a ballistic transport. You can now uh, have drug delivery uh, using graphene, which has already been shown. You can make it water soluble by some functionalization and so on, uh, resistive switching, gas sensors and some of this what is happening in our lab. So here you have a graphene membrane which is impermeable to gas but also very strong. So graphene membranes is a big gate now for applications in this field. So this is again some statistics which I did not uh, spend much, first to show that graphene research is growing at the rate of almost 58% per year. Phenomenal it is and this graph I like from this uh, 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 report, what he has plotted is 2004 is the science paper and then the author which I referred last time, uh, last one in uh, this uh, uh, website, they plot how many papers appeared referring to this or using this and you can see these are the uh, dots which are appearing each year it is growing like a, almost a huge wave and the impact time evolution, evolution if you see from the year of discovery graphene is way way up as compared to fullerenes and nanotubes. Started very late but this exciting physics and possible applications make it go and if you look at web of science which I just did two days before coming you can see that in 2010 already 2,000 papers have been published and the citations is 45,000 in this 2010 and so on. Actually, it's more than exponential, it's many higher power of n. So, a uh, e raised power minus n raised power alpha prime. So, it's an enormous increase because people are able to make these devices, people are able to make these systems and study not only the uh, science part but also a hope for many applications. And this is reflected in patents. So number of patents uh, last year was uh, 150, covering many areas. And already the, there are uh, companies which work with the graphene devices, graphene applications. So with this uh, longish introduction, I thought in the last uh, 20 minutes, I will just tell you some aspect of our work and I will just touch upon two or three of these aspects and one aspect is one which started in 2003. It's an old story but again revived 
because of some new developments. So the that is related to which is what I call nanotube dynamo liquid flow induced voltage generation, uh, 2003 results, and subsequently what has happened. So I want to bring you up to date on why this is still an open problem and we need to understand more. So this is something I will tell you and then briefly discuss some uh, other nanotechnology platforms and graphene uh, device if the time permits. So this result is rather uh, seven year old where we showed which was done uh, in uh, my Shankar Ghosh who is in DIFR and Professor N. Kumar, uh, other past president of our academy. Uh, uh, so here what we had shown was that if you take this single wall carbon nanotubes and flow liquid over them, variety of liquids, you can generate voltage and current. This is what we had shown long back. And this uh, was done in a very simple minded fashion. You make flow alignment of the tubes between them put these two gold electrodes and flow liquid over it like this and what you generate is the voltage. Now this voltage is the flow induced voltage only coming when you have a flow and this you can see it is in millivolts and this is the velocity of the liquid, average velocity of the liquid. It is highly sublinear. So our idea was it would be linear because the flow will drag the electrons. So uh, current will be proportional to the uh, momentum transfer and we will get a linear relationship which we did not get. So this puzzled uh, quite a bit and, we, uh, and when we plotted the same data on a log scale, uh, linear log scale, over six orders of magnitude it fits to a log form. So the voltage generated is a logarithmic function of the flow velocity. This is something very robust result over many orders of magnitude and here we show that if you reverse the flow direction you change the uh, sign of the voltage. So the voltage you generate the magnitude and the sign depends on the flow. But another thing we found which we did not elaborate at that time that the effect which we see depends on what are the ionic, uh, what are the ions present in water. So if you make a control experiment with very highly distilled water but now put controlled amount 1 millimolar of lithium perchlorate or 1 millimolar of cesium hydroxide, uh, you can see that the results will be totally different. Same nanotube, it gives you 1 millivolt positive signal but when you change this ions, you get half of that and reverse the signal. So the magnitude and direction of current depends on the ions which are present in water. If you take polar liquid, then you have other effects, uh, other uh, interesting things. So here again uh, 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 we uh, showed which we have not uh, published but it is very intriguing results because we do not have an explanation. Now we think we understand different uh, in, uh, in ions give you different results or uh, depending on how much you have and so on. So a very uh, intriguing part is that it depends on the ion type as well as how much they are present. And here we showed, uh, sorry now, just uh, in the last few years many groups have uh, worked on this problem. So I will just give you a, a sampling of what new things they have done. So this group uh, from Ohio State University showed that the same effect occurs even in multi wall nanotubes if you can align them. In our paper we showed that the multi wall nanotube gives you much smaller result and single wall gives you very many uh, much more voltage. If they are not aligned their results are similar to ours micro volt but when they align all the nanotubes then it depends uh, what we had shown in the same way. The red graph is the theory from our paper which shows that you can get now these uh, voltages which is the order of 22 millivolts just by aligning this multi wall nanotube and you can get very very large signals from these uh, nanotubes. And this is another paper which appeared which is very beautiful. They take single single wall nanotube, one tube, few microns long, connect four electrodes. Now what they are saying is they, so we showed if you pass, there is a liquid flow you get current. 
Question is, if you pass current, will you get a flow? Reverse. So they showed that you can show that they pass current through this, the liquid is sucked in because there is a water vapor in the chamber. So they generate the flow out of current, the first part. How do they know now? The next part, they generate the voltage, they put electrode. So that flow gives them the voltage. So this is the smallest guinea book record of motor generator from a nanotube. So the nanotube acts like a motor because it generates the flow by passing current and now that flow gives you the electricity. So this is the motor generator using the effect which we demonstrated in 2003. This is their results and recently in 2010 they, uh, another group has shown that you can embed these nanotubes in a polymer matrix in a microfluidic device and again you can use them to measure the flow in a microfluidic device. You can embed them on the surface of the polymer and again you get the signals which we talked about. So these are some samplings of what has happened subsequent to what we had done. Now the recent experiments got motivated which is what I will discuss in the next few minutes is what happens with the gas flow? I mentioned that. So in 2004, we had shown that if you flow gases over carbon nanotubes, you generate voltage, no doubt. But that is a different effect which is not unique to nanotubes. It can occur for a semiconductor. That needs very high velocities, like 5 meter per second and so on. So one team came to us from outside and they had the following puzzle. I'll tell you the puzzle which set us going on these experiments. The puzzle these had, this was a team of doctors and they said that can you measure the breathing of a patient? Which means when a patient is breathing, can you give us a signal that this is the flow, this is the breathing speed of the patient? And surprisingly, there is no sensor right now which can measure such a low uh, gas flow. There is no sensor right now. So, because anemometers don't work at those speeds, at those uh, low velocities. So, this was a challenge where we did not know that we could use the gas flow effect because it needs much higher speeds. But then my student came out with a very brilliant idea and that is what we tried out. So, he said that Nanotubes are very sensitive to the liquid flow. Very, very low velocity you can detect. Even one micrometer per second you can detect. Can we convert breathing into a liquid flow problem? So the idea was to cool the nanotubes below 5 degrees centigrade. So the water vapors in the breath will condense on the nanotube and that thin layer of water will be pushed by the breathing, by the gas. So this is what he wanted to try out. I said, let's do that. And this was done now with multi-wall nanotube. So we have now aligned multi-wall nanotube from our collaborators. And now these are the multi-wall nanotubes which are stacked together. These are all aligned. And we fix the electrodes at two ends and flow. So what do we do? We simulate the breathing. We can't do the breathing. Uh, people uh, will not be volunteers for so long. So what we have done is, we mix air, little bit of air with dry nitrogen. So we know by humidity we can introduce few, uh, some amount of water vapor. We did that in a controlled manner in this chamber and what we are plotting, we are studying is the flow of the nitrogen gas which is like our breath. So with that we wanted to see the effect and the problem is now a nice engineering problem. So when you have such a problem, the water will condense, it will form a boundary layer. We know exactly how it is from the engineering literature. And now when we have gas, this is the boundary layer on which the gas is moving. So it's a very nice engineering problem in the heat transfer. And this is what we analyze. And once we do that, what we see is that as soon as you cool to 7 degrees, this multi-wall nanotubes, the signatures immediately comes from the, uh, when the gas, uh, when the uh, velocity is non-zero to zero. And this signal is few micro, not millivolt, micro. We are working with multi tubes, not the highest quality. And this signal is measured 
uh, as a function of uh, gas velocity, it is very small, uh, 0.5, and you can see that this effect only occurs when the water vapor condenses on the nanotube. And most surprisingly, which is still not fully understood, when we cool to below zero degree, this is done by thermoelectric cooling, when we cool to minus 3 to minus 7, when everything is covered in ice, complete ice, nanotubes are not even facing uh, gas, even then the signal is very, very large and uh, a significant, few micro. So, so now we have puzzles that even the nanotube is not facing the uh, uh, water, it is because it is all condensed, how do we understand? And this is the challenge we recently did, uh, the steam effect. Question is, now will it be uh, present even at high temperature? So how do we do it? So again, we uh, this uh, student came out with this very bright idea. We heat this aluminium plate to any temperature you want. That's a 400 degree centigrade. Within that, you have put this uh, less than a millimeter of nanotubes. So when you put water drop, it immediately becomes steam, which you know in kitchen that it becomes uh, rolls, and it just zooms past. And this, when it passes over this, you get the electrical signal. And that is what is measured when, so the effect is present when the steam passes over the nanotubes. So we have other effects which I will not discuss. But all this tells us that there is there are puzzles in our understanding why this effect is occurring uh, when it is sensitive to the type of ions, why it is even present when there is ice on this and so on. Before I discuss that, uh, I just wanted to tell you some very simple uh, applications of this which might have relevance in the context of GOA that you can have underwater detection of vibrations using nano. So the available sensors are the pressure sensors. When you put them under sea, the uh, pressure effect on them gives you the voltage because of this piezoelectricity. All those sensors are not very useful below 1 hertz because 1 over F noise is too high. So when you do that, you get into trouble that you cannot detect vibrations below 1 hertz. But in nanotube, this is not the case. So we made a swimming pool in the lab and put the vibration at one end of the pool and put the nanotubes at the other end and see you will see that uh, it is very very sensitive and it is sensitive even to one millihertz because here we are not even amplifying the signal. You can go to high frequency, you can go low frequency and the nanotubes directly sense the velocity and give you the signal. Other experiment which we have done, can it be used to detect the vibration of a solid surface? So the idea is to make an accelerometer using nanotubes. So what we have done, the trick here is, we take this nanotubes and put it at the end of a cantilever. Now this cantilever is embedded in a water body. It's a small capsule like what you eat. In that capsule is kept on the surface whose vibration you want to measure. So when this surface vibrates, this cantilever starts vibrating and because of that this nanotubes move against water. So you generate a voltage because now the nanotubes are moving against static water and that gives you again a very sensitive uh, detection of the solid uh, surface vibration and to low frequencies what you want. So this is the story of this application. So now let me, last part I want to discuss, do we understand these results? Now, first question we have to ask, which is uh, not obvious, does water enter nanotubes? Because at one nanometer level, it is not obvious that your concepts of capillary action, surface tension, all those things will translate very smoothly into these concepts. So people have been uh, doing computer simulations to show that water can enter nanotube only if it is above 8 angstrom. Below 8 angstrom, water does not enter because there is a hydrophobic surf, uh, distance which water likes to maintain from carbon. So you need 8 angstrom of the space. Once you do that, it can enter in the simulations. So we wanted to do an experiment to see what is the situation. Now how do we do the experiment that water is only inside the nanotube? There is no easy way we can fill a 1 nanometer tube. So what we do is we put very small quantity of the nanotube in water. 
so water goes in water is outside now we need a technique which is only sensitive to confined water so that's where the uh, what we get is this nuclear magnetic resonance proton nmr to our help so proton nmr is so beautiful that the relaxation time of a proton t2 of water is much larger than that of solid ice so bulk water gives you a very sharp peak which is about 1 hertz in uh, width uh, you know that ice does not give any proton nmr signal because t2 has become very small so we use this to uh, do the experiment below 0 degree centigrade where water is frozen outside and the signal which you get is if it is present is really the confined water so this is the signal at 300 kelvin at below uh, freezing point which is uh, very very weak then for 7 times weak you get a very broad signal a uh, few uh, hundreds of mega uh, hundreds of hertz and this survives till about 70 degree centigrade minus 70 degree centigrade that is the uh, limitation of our experiment so confined water does not freeze till minus 70 degrees and simulations show that it can persist as confined water as liquid water even at lesser temperature so this is something now we know that when we are flowing uh, liquid water is going inside as well as outside and another question we ask which is again a nice question if water goes in is it the same as our bulk water namely what is the diffusion of this water there also we know that if you have a nano tube which is small it will have a very different motion because this water molecule cannot move till this moves and so on so this is called single file diffusion like in military this immediately tells in statistical mechanics that mean square displacement does not go linear in time which is the case for bulk water but it goes under root t so the confined water if it is there it will have a under root time dependence rather than the linear time dependence this can have relevance for membrane water this can have relevance for many channels zeolites and so on but such an experiment has not been done so we did this experiment recently in nano tubes and this is done again by called pulsed field gradient method in nmr this is done in collaboration with professor anil kumar and professor kv ramanathan of our institute and their students so this is a collaborative work which uh, measures the diffusion of water in the uh, uh, nano tubes below 0 degree centigrade and after i will not go into detail but the end result is water goes in and this mean square displacement versus time which is linear for bulk water becomes under root time and this is a conclusive proof that confined water is there and when you have all this flow and so on this is something which you have to take into account so at this stage i will now come to the uh, uh, few uh, the last in last few minutes how do we understand the effect with which i started do we understand now there have been many theories since our paper some are from our group some are from other groups and simulations all these things are struggling to understand the sublinear dependence on velocity and what is the mechanism and uh, so on. but still no clue on why should it even depends on i why should it so first idea was that you have electrons in nano tube you have water flow you have uh, ionic impurities they will couple to electrons and will drag them along and at high velocity they will not be able to get along with each other and Uh, qualitatively perhaps this is what is happening we thought but it is more complex because this will not explain why cesium hydroxide is di different than lithium perchlorate so the last uh, part is to describe what our new model is this model is still developing it is not uh, yet uh, uh, all the uh, 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 things have not been fixed but i thought nothing better than sharing with this audience uh what are the new idea or what are the fresh ideas we have and i would love to have interaction if some of you have ideas so the idea is what is called quantum friction so the idea is that 
if you have two bodies, you always have uh, interaction between them, right? Van der Waal interaction, which is nothing but electromagnetic radiations around each uh, body and they interact. Now, if this body moves, this is having the electromagnetic field, which will be Doppler shifted with respect to this body. This is what is called in the literature as quantum friction or the Van der Waal friction. So the idea is when you have a moving body with respect to other, it will have a friction and it can drag things in this layer even though this layer is not moving. So the idea is that if you have a 2D electron gas and you move something on it and if they are coupled because of this quantum friction, they can generate current. And this is what we uh, want, uh, which we use. And the end result of this model, I will only give you what the final result is. With this uh, Van der Waal friction, we show that when you move things outside, what you are able to do is you align the dipoles of water inside. So all the action is happening inside the carbon nanometers. So water dipoles get aligned and which gives you a huge dipole and a voltage which induces a voltage in the nanotube and you measure. So the effect is alignment of water dipoles because of the flow. So this uh, can have following interesting consequences. It can, it can also explain when there is ice inside because the water inside is still not frozen, they can still get aligned. And now, if you have uh, ions like cesium hydroxide, in this case, cesium is much bigger than OH. OH preferentially enters, even simulations show. And now, the dipole moments are aligned in this fashion, which is exactly opposite if you have lithium perchlorate, because lithium enters the nanotube and not the perchlorate. And this reverses the alignment of water dipoles. So the sensitivity of this voltage to the size of the ion makes uh, this voltage difference uh, uh, dif uh, in opposite sign as we show in this model. So with this, uh, this model, we are able to explain some of the new features which we are observing and still more to be understood. So in the last uh, two, three minutes, I'll just say that many more possibilities are there to work on this. But one part which is again interdisciplinary uh, which we have been doing is to look at other nano other platforms, other nano platforms because there are biologists here, chemists here so I thought I will just mention it and one platform which is again very popular of course quantum dots, liposomes, polymers and dendrimer is the platform which we want to use. So dendrimer platform with nanotubes is something we are trying to explore. And this is the work uh, being done with the, uh, Professor N. Jairaman from Organic Chemistry, who is the inventor of a new class of dendrimer called Patil. And these are non-toxic uh, uh, dendrimers. There are other PAMM and other dendrimers, but his dendrimer has many, many more uh, uh, advantages, which I have written here. And our idea is to use it as a gene delivery. So the nanotubes come as the vectors for this dendrimer. So the idea is, can we load these dendrimers on the nanotube? Because nanotubes can go easily into a cell and we can use whatever genes or drugs which we want to load on this dendrimer and put them inside. So the first question is whether dendrimers interact with nanotubes and then we load them. So the first experiment was this, which is done uh, in collaboration with Professor Jairaman, his student and my student and Prabal who is a computer simulation to know how is it happening. So that, uh, I will just tell you briefly this is the attempt to make a synthetic vector, nanotube as a synthetic vector to uh, put the dendrimer and the associated genes and uh, uh, drugs into the cell and see if it will work. So first item is whether it will go in. So I will not tell the long story. Here what we show is dendrimer alone has huge fluorescence, inherent fluorescence, no probophore. This fluorescence gets quenched when they interact with the nanotube. So we use the quenching of the fluorescence and quantify this interaction. So this uh, fluorescence quenches, which is one signature. And another signature is, is nanotube getting affected? So here what we show, 
that nanotube resistance if you make a device changes very drastically when you put a dendrite so again the nanotubes change dendrimers change because the fluorescence is getting quenched and also the computer simulation suggests that uh, raman also we do to show the shifts in the phonon frequencies and uh, the simulation exactly tells how the dendrimers are interacting with them so this example was just to show the interdisciplinary uh, nature and the questions you can ask along with the uh, nanotubes as a platform other platform like quantum dots and dendrimer to ish uh, ask this question so the other uh, experiments happening in this is to look at siRNA nanotube interaction how they interact how they will go in and so on so these are the experiments which will go in i think i'll close this uh, and go to the last part which i will not uh, discuss i have told you about the graphene you can make devices but this last part is very interesting you can make now graphene in tons easily so what you do is you take graphite i am changing gear for a minute just to close my talk you can take exfoliated graphite you can oxidize them then they all become single sheets you can make colloidal suspension of single sheet graphene these days in any amount you want then you can reduce them again by chemical method or by light lasers or by heating and you can make single sheets of graphene now you can do it in any amount you want and we showed that you can make devices by a very simple method you take a drop of this graphene put between the two electrodes put high frequency radio field this is called dielectrophoresis and you can make a graphene between the two electrodes and this device is very good as a sensor as a field effect transistor and so on and this is what we recently showed and this only tells that now many many more things you can do uh, with this chemically produced graphene and not only the exfoliated so i think i will close this uh, uh, address to summarize that uh, idea was to introduce this carbon nanotubes and graphene uh, excitement in the field uh, started with this flow induced voltage generation which brought us to uh, a, a new proposal to understand this effect in terms of alignment of water dipoles uh, due to van der waal friction which can have uh, interesting consequences and uh, in the last fleeting moments i mentioned cnt along with other platforms namely dendrimers and so on and the last part which i mentioned in the beginning but in elaborate that graphene and its devices and many more applications are just beginning to take shape so with this i thank you once again and please One is uh, the, the announcement which is just. Yeah. <coughs> I saw that uh, it has been made that a uh, single state of carbon has been uh, reacted with fluoride. This fluoride material is so strong that it will be hundreds of applications. including aircraft like your cis base craft materials and also in cooking vessels because it will not be degraded and uh, it has been done by a student of the man who got the nobel prize he is called uh, ralph nair a phd student only last week and it has numerous such applications and there are other questions i won't uh, take your time other people may have yeah. but this is uh, something please use fluoride for okay. extraordinary uh, things I just i wanted to uh, update on it. this is right actually they i uh, didn't have time to touch on it another thing which has become very popular now is you interact hydrogen with graphene right. and now it's called graphene there is no common name right now for fluorine attachment but graphene changes even this band structure so instead of having a completely zero band gap a band gap opens between the valence band and conduction band and that has many interesting device implications and or whatever you said has all this uh, mechanical strength and so on and i completely uh, uh, endorse and say that much more is happening in this composites graphene and its composites and so on
Ja. Ja. Yes, please. You have this word dynamo in your talk. Yeah. But I know it's word dynamo at all. Okay, so dynamo was a catchy word to tell that you can induce, uh, you can produce electricity, electrical voltage and current from the flow. So that was the sense and then I also showed that uh, the experiment of other group where they use uh, reverse effect to generate the flow and then again the voltage. So nanotube dynamo is in the sense of converting a mechanical energy into electrical energy. So that is the sense. Yeah. Replacement of silicon by graphene. Sorry. Replacement of silicon by graphene is that. Please uh, make it. I'm so sorry. Okay. Okay. I'll speak up. Replacement of uh, silicon yeah. by graphene. Is that only meant for niche application or routine yeah. computers? And in that case, if, if it is the latter, how far uh, in the future should we really act? Okay, see, okay. Uh, I think as I said, uh, the fact that these are fast devices because you have the high mobility, only in the fast devices it will have a niche, but semiconductor industry is extraordinarily well developed. So there is no competition to silicon devices. but. Now the emphasis is on fast devices, maybe resistive switching devices and so on where there is a niche thing. But I should not uh, leave you with a uh, thing that it is happening tomorrow. Point is the on off ratio of these devices is still very low because they don't have a band gap. Right? Because there is no valence band conduction band separation. So this has to be tackled to make the slightly more uh, gap without losing the mobility uh, advantage and then see. So in that context, this graphene has a good role. Now with silicon carbide being used as a substrate and then you can make tons of graphene, whatever you want, is a long way, a long, uh, is a large scale method. Chemical vapor deposition of graphene which I mentioned uh, splitting uh, methane on a copper or a nickel substrate is another hope. But those graphenes have too many defects right now. So if you can grow them at low temperature, will happen. But all this is less than a year old. So with time, I hope many much progress will be done. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't understand this dendrimer replication because dendrimer will not go inside the nanotube. No, it is outside. Outside. So, what kind of properties you expect? So, what we are uh, proposing, uh, what actually some experiments are already on, I didn't have time. So, dendrimer is used on a nanotube as a piggy ride. Now, nanotubes have been shown to go inside the cells more effectively than any other vector. So the hope is with this you can put the dendrimer inside and you can load many things on the dendrimer. No, but what about small molecules, organic like tetracyanokinones and all? So if they are on the nano, see they alone will not go inside the cell that easy. No, but outside graphene because graphene is yeah. electron rich. See? Correct. Tetracyanokinone which are electron Correct. deficient molecules and tetracyanokinone. Right. So graphene is also being now tried as a vector. So both are actually uh, experiments are uh, very, very beginning of this game where graphene is also playing here. That's correct. So graphene and nanotube, hopefully they will be the factors. Yeah. Uh, in graphite, we used to have this staging in graphite. Now you Sorry? can make first stage graphite, second yeah. stage. Uh, has anybody tried that? Because that gives you a good control of getting uh, one layer graphene, two sure. layer graphene, yeah. one layer graphene. Right. Is there any work like that? Yeah, so what people are trying right now, first to take exfoliated graphite, which you do by various things, stage one, stage two, all those. Once you have this exfoliated graphite, then you do another chemical treatment to separate. But recently people have shown, uh, I don't think it is yet published, but uh, that if you take this graphite and put just some surfactant, Variety of surfactant, non-ionic surfactant, and sonicate for one hour, you can get graphene. So you don't even need to oxidize the graphite now. No, 
I was telling in the intercalated things, you yeah. normally put I, like Correct. potassium. Or that is what is exfoliated you yeah. do. But you can get the different stages. Correct. You can so you will, see what I am saying, even with this acid treatment, you can get now single layer. So anything you do which can exfoliate will happen. Okay, I think uh, I'll close this uh, session because uh, we have to start on the next one. And uh, thank you once again to Dr. Shetty and his team for all this wonderful.